Yeah, so first of all, I wanted to just thank all the, the students from the MA Cultural Studies who put all this together. Uh, a really fantastic survey um, of, of the field and the, the topic. Um, but I'd also like to see them, you know, coming back next year to present at the next round of um, next round of student student conferences. So consider that uh, an assignment rather than um, a provocation. You, you will be required to, to return. Um, so this is the talk I want to give. Um, black sites and transparency layers. Thanks. Uh, and I want to use it to think about these, these two terms as kind of fundamental to the operation of uh, contemporary modes of power, uh, to think about the way in which the virtues of transparency, of openness, of clarity of, um, clarity of, of process uh, are fundamental to the contemporary mode of, of regulation. Uh, but also to think about the way in which um, this mode of power in relationship to the question of transparency also relies on and is implicated by um, other forms, black sites, black boxes, things that are opaque chambers. In a sense, this is obviously um, a kind of a, a way of thinking about global politics but it's also a way of thinking about um, the, ro the role of institutions, the way in which uh, organisations run, and so on. And I want to talk about it specifically individual uh, at the beginning uh, through the question of interface, the question of um, computer interface specifically. Partly in the context of this conference, because interfaces... Um, are an address to the subject. They're an address to the way in which the subject is read by the machine. Uh, so the, the interface presents you with um, modes of operation on, in, and as data. And as part of the process um, that it will entail you in. So if the interface is a way to read off the subject... Uh, the interface also provides an action grammar to stabilize entities and arrange processes. So the interface is where um, neoliberation meets the subject and constitutes the subject. It offloads your need to uh, stabilize yourself as a subject in that it does that work for you quite well. It encourages you, uh, as some marketing slogan has it, to be yourself but better. And I'm sure you'll all be improved by the end of this, this lecture. Um, what I also want to talk about is how this kind of question of transparency uh, and black sites moves across into uh, architecture. And specifically, I want to look at the architecture of recent tech corporation headquarters, um, partly as a kind of, uh, as a way of, of kind of thinking how the, the logic of uh, the, the present material cultures scales up from the, from the interface to, um, to buildings, campuses, and so on, and then also move on to uh, some artworks which uh, address these kind of questions in different ways. So what I want to present also is not a, a criticism of the mode of, of transparency, uh, so specifically not to say, oh, they say that they're transparent, and then they do this. Uh, on the one hand, they say they're open, then they're closed. Uh, this, this kind of um, mode of critical reflection. But to try and think of what are the, what are the kind of constituted grammars um, that computer interfaces, architecture of different kinds, uh, and so on, produce. So I want to propose that the interface... Um, is kind of paradigmatic for understanding the interplays and modulations between the operations of transparency and opacity that takes to the present. So if, if opacity is a kind of classic mode of power, if you think back to, say, Machiavelli uh, or some of the, the other manuals for power, um, 
the question of opacity, of keeping the seat of power hidden, uh, is, is, is fundamental. So the power circulates, uh, but it circulates from a, a hidden position. What I think is interesting in, in the present mode of, of power is this, um, this sense of the way in which it addresses, addresses us through um, microscopic interfaces, or microscopic entities such as interfaces, but also uh, through, through other kinds of operation. If you think of uh, the, the, the way an exemplary form would be the way in which uh, the system of drone killing uh, operates in the present, which is both omnipresent, but is also um, uh, reserved back to a, a central place in the Nevada desert. And so if you think of this, the, um, this movement of omnipresence and, and complete surveillance, of utter transparency, uh, which at the same time withdraws back to these uh, shipping containers containing uh, sweaty gentlemen uh, in front of screens on 12-hour shifts. So these are the, these, this kind of movement is, is what I'm interested in and how this movement is staged um, both at the level of the desktop uh, but also um, in terms of a, a geopolitics, in terms of, of architecture. Okay, so to start, we'll look at this... Um, we'll look at this image. Does anyone remember this interface? It's so young and so fresh. <laughs> um, actually, if you remembered it, it would be a false memory syndrome and we'd have to call the councillors. It doesn't exist. Um, but it's, it's a parody of the early Macintosh interfaces, System 7. Mm, that was good. Uh, it's, it's basically uh, it's an, in, an illustration from a text uh, called the Anti-Mac Interface, um, which, if the book sniffers amongst you, there's a really small reference there. You can see it, uh, Gertner and Nielsen. Uh, it's a critique of the idea of metaphor in interface. Yeah, so what they do is, obviously, you have um, things like your address book, which is your Rolodex. You want to get in touch with someone. You, you send them an email. So it's the metaphor of the, the inbox and the outbox. Uh, you've got a diary, of course. You have a keyboard. Um, Many, many other useful items which you have on your um, uh, which you have on your desktop. So the whole idea is that the computer, in this mode, achieves transparency of its function by showing the way that it works, um, by exemplifying the way it works through a metaphor. Yeah, so that these metaphors exist um, in present-day operating systems, but they're they're also fundamentally. Uh, removed. So the mode of transparency of understanding what the inter what the interface is for, or what the what the computer does, was worked through the idea of an intuitive metaphor. You know, the idea that if you want to um, look at something in detail, you get an oil lamp, for instance. Obviously, highly intuitive. We all understand what that means. Uh, if you want to write something, <laughs> you you take a keyboard. Um, the problem they wanted to address with this um, was that the, the object domain, the, 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 metaf the metaphoric domain, does not necessarily refer to the target domain. Yeah? So that if you want to throw away a document, you don't necessarily uh, understand that the, you, you drop it into the wastebasket. Yeah? Because, you know, because you're good citizens of the 21st century, the wastebasket is, of course, solely reserved for uh, recycling. Uh, so you don't necessarily want the eternal return of the same document, which is what the recycling might suggest. Here, then, you have an address to uh, an idealised subject, which is an idealised subject of the office worker, or the kind of the cosy home desk worker, with a filing cabinet in the right-hand corner for this, all the big data that you'll be collecting. Um, but what the, the critique that Nielsen um, and, and Gertner suggest is the kind of critique that follows through from um, the word that they use called skeuomorphism. Has anyone heard this? Anyone has got a design degree? Okay, so skeuomorphism is a fantastically snappy word that 
uh, designers use to talk about a metaphor that's introduced in order to describe the functioning of uh, a new technology. So, for instance, in the early 20th century, when tractors were first introduced, uh, some of mechanical tractors, some of the first tractors uh, had, instead of a steering wheel, you had uh, mechanical reins. Yeah? So you imagine you were driving a horse. Uh, by pulling on these reins, you would steer the tractor. Um, the car, the automobile, often referred to as a horseless carriage at first, hence the, the abbreviation car, um, also had design features that made it look more like a, uh, something was pulled by a horse. These were then supposed to explain and make, and make people comfortable with the operation of this, this wild new technology uh, of the internal combustion engine that would then you know, take them plunging headfirst into the future. The same thing with the personal computer. It had to look like um, what, what people imagined a desktop would look like, what a, what a cosy home office uh, would look like. And much of this kind of continues through to the present, and we'll kind of run through some of that uh, as, as this talk goes on. But this kind of, this grammar that's set up of knowable objects and knowable operations um, masked a lot of what the computer could do, and it masked a lot of the power of computational processes. So as time went on, there were criticisms uh, of this. The anti-Mac interface uh, from the mid-90s made a critique of it based around uh, a re-reading of the Mac, Mac operating system from the point of view of uh, the unit of Unix. The idea was that um, metaphor-based interfaces infantilized users, kept people um, working in a mode of operation that was strongly retrospective, and they wanted to propose uh, a way of thinking of com computational systems or computational interfaces that were much closer to uh, the sophisticated kinds of operations that were uh, achievable through Unix. So what do we get in the present day? Uh, let's have a look. Something like this, the Zoom uh, music player. It's the first um, system, first graphic, first mass computational system that broke with, um, if we go back to this, you've got representation of 3D objects, shallow, um, shallow 3D in, in essence. Here you have something that um, embraces the screen as a, as a, as a two-dimensional object that represents files um, as, as just simply flat elements of graphic design. Here you move into a um, more contemporary Windows operating system, uh, which drew on, this, um, drew on this mode of flat design, broke with um, the idea of, of drop shadows, of uh, metaphor-based um, interface, and tried to, structure the, tried to structure the operating system as something that uh, at least tried to, tried to um, introduce the idea of con contemporaneity to the operating system. So if we think back to, um, if we think across from here to the Macintosh operating system at present, you get things like um, bookshelves for e-books that look like bookshelves or software interfaces that look like brushed aluminium. These, in a way, um, these interface objects also represented power struggles within um, Apple as a company. So different branches of the company would have, um, uh, would champion different modes of interface. And the fallout of these would also represent, the, the rise and fall of different interface modes would also represent, would be represented on the desktop. So if we think of this, the way in which uh, this carries through um, from the idea of skeuomorphic design or retrospective design, you still have basic form factors that are, that are the same. So if you think of your smartphone, uh, your, your laptop, these still continue the form factor of uh, a notepad or um, a book. So there's, there's a certain continuity of form, but there's, in a sense, 
now an attempt to uh, develop an interface and to develop an, an interface that addresses subjects that are contemporary. So we break with modeling the computer on um, the past, modeling the computer on, on desktops or um, Rolodexes and phones. And we try and think, okay, the, the mode is to try and think what the computer is at the present. And in doing so, we also read off what the subject is that is supposed to know, use, and inhabit uh, these spaces. So the spaces of flat design address us uh, within the grammar that they set up. And you can see um, this move uh, to, this, to this flat aesthetic um, is fundamental in, across uh, Google's Polymer language or the material design language within Google. Um, the Windows design language, which we can see here. Um, this, again, you can see this shift. And what you get is something slightly different to uh, the operating system, uh, the operating mode of metaphor. In the, um, the Mac interface, based around Windows icon, mouse, and pointer, you had uh, a system of, of objects that you applied nouns to. Systems um, like a file that you would open or a piece of, piece of text that you would select. In this mode, um, what becomes clear is that the data becomes more active. So the data is represented uh, as more dynamic. There is, there is less scope for operation by the user. So flat design changes the way in which uh, we interface with the with the machines. It moves the, the main mode of interface to tablets and touch screen interfaces. And also presents the data as fundamentally more dynamic. So in this uh, a screen like this, you will have data that's, that's changing, uh, for instance, weather information, time information, and so on. But there's also less information on the screen. There are less icons. There's just the, the thing is supposed to be uh, operable by fingers rather than by uh, a cursor that selects pixels. So there's a sense of a reduction of the scope of operations within the operating system. And you can see this carrying over to, uh, this is a, a Linux distribution uh, version of Ubuntu. You can see this carrying over uh, to the main kind of open source or free software uh, models as well. And here we have it in this paradigm uh, exemplified of the relation between screens. So this is a, an Android marketing um, image that also shows us not only the, the, the introduction of, of flat design, but also shows the, um, the user as something between layers of uh, information systems. So if we can think of these, this change within the operating system, between the mode of the operating system, changes the idea of what transparency is. It moves from an idea of intuition based around recognizable objects to uh, a transparency that's based around assuming the subjects of use, the users of the operating system, are contemporaneous with and understand the operating system. Yeah, so it assumes you have um, you, you, you have no need for metaphor to guide you anymore. You're there co-present in the same culture as the interface. So understanding this interface uh, is also uh, a way of understanding what the, what the, the corporations, the designers, uh, and others take to be present culture. Related to this is the question of how this, this scales up. So that we can say this, uh, if we follow the kind of the arguments of people like Keller Easterling and others, um, work on the question of, of standards and the form factors that make contemporary standards. Uh, we also see the way in which um, objects such as this, these basic form factors that we all, we all recognize and are familiar with, uh, produce the contemporary vocabulary um, of, of interfaces and, and of therefore subjects. And one of the key things we can see with contemporary design, specifically flat design, 
is uh, what Jonathan Ive from Apple calls the imperative to simplify, remove, and reduce clutter. Yeah, so this, this lean, uh, straightforward, self-describing, minimal uh, set of operations. So the movement within this um, goes from clicking points and dragging objects, interacting a grammar of objects and verbs, or nouns and verbs, as a classic uh, Macintosh interface, to a movement of swiping, touching, launching. Uh, one activates nouns, apps, or objects of information, but the verbs are contained within the app's preset functions. So one of the kind of criticisms of apps, fundamentally, is that they've changed the action grammar of, of the user uh, from someone that's active within information to someone that really uh, just simply processes uh, information rather than necessarily generates it. One has a windows into um, data that's self-generating. As devices become more autonomous, running processes independently of the user, often in relationship to servers, perhaps with smaller screens, drop shadows, gradients, and other elements geared towards giving an impression of three dimensions to the user have been deprecated. There's a move from dealing with documents to using data and services that represents part of the shift uh, to cloud computing as a way of centralizing control over computational processes, uh, but also um, the movement from, of the internet of users to the internet of things. Here uh, we can see also there's as well as a changing understanding of the user, there's also a changing understanding of what data is and how people generate, interact with, uh, and are objects of data. So data is, is dynamic, data is processual, uh, and it is, is, data is multiple. We have access to it via, um, by multiple, uh, by multiple means, hence the proliferation of things like um, watches, uh, tags, uh, and other things that address data to us or from us in different ways. If we compare this TV uh, to this one, you can see also that the form factor uh, has fundamentally changed. You know, if we think of TV as moving from something with controls around the screen, a, sp a visible speaker, um, a case. Here we move to something that is pure screen. You know, so the object of, of, the, of, the, of the video monitor, of the TV, of the surface inter in, of interaction is um, all the controls are moved into the screen. So there's, there's a change also in the way in which um, the screen addresses us. So if we think of um, smartphones, television, TV monitors, plasma screens, etc., etc. Um, smart TVs, as exemplified here. There's a sense of the things that one would use previously to engage with the with the surface have become part of the surface. So, TV, one could say, or the screen, has become uh, contemporary with itself. So at the same time as we have this movement of uh, interface, changing our relationship to um, data processes and data structures, we also have changes behind the screen. So one of the, uh, the fundamental changes in interface is also interfaces between programs. So the interface that faces the user changes. The user is interpolated as, uh, as, as, a, as a contemporaneous subject rather than a retrospective subject. We also have changes in relationship to uh, the screen, but we also have behind the scenes interfaces between, um, between pieces of software. So an API is an application program interface, is an interface uh, between pieces of software. Yeah, so if you're, if you're writing uh, an app you'll that will work on top of another platform, uh, this is 
a diagram, a very crude diagram of um, Netflix. You will write to these things uh, in the middle, APIs that interface one program to another interface, to another program. They allow small windows of data to be accessible within, um, within one program. This would allow, for instance, um, developers who are wanting to develop third-party apps uh, for Netflix to gain access to some of the key data that Netflix would make available. And the API basically pushes data out as text. So there might be uh, ranking mechanisms, names of films, uh, film inf the, the kind of data that Netflix would basically make available uh, about their films. So reviews, titles, directors, this kind of stuff. So very heavily... Um, standardized, very heavily categorized um, reams of data that would then be um, recodable into uh, other applications. So when we're looking at interfaces as a means of uh, art, you know, mapping the relationship between black boxes and transparency, here, things like application program interfaces are fundamental modes of that or fundamental parts of that architecture. They both construct something that is um, closed, the black box, what, what is behind the API, but they also construct a uh, mode a kind of transparency in that the data that is accessible from the API, which may run into thousands of different categories of data, or only a few. Um, allows services to be, or allows processes, allows services, allows uh, forms of data to become addressable via other means. So here, in, this, in the development of these systems, you have a kind of fundamental architectural propensity to negotiating the relationship between transparency, openness, and integration of systems, always, though, um, interpolated by the question of what data is closed, what is open, uh, what is made accessible, and what is, what is kept internal to a system. So in STS, uh, we have the word, we have the term black box. It derives uh, originally from the 1940s, to aeronautic recorders, was then used uh, by cybernetics to describe uh, what happens in behaviorism. So if, if, if we remember cybernetics' uh, critique of behaviorism was that it treated animals, people, uh, and so on out simply as black boxes with input and output. Uh, cybernetics was an attempt to go inside the black box. STS, and particularly actor network theory, uses uh, the term black box to describe something that has been sufficiently stabilized uh, to, to be known as, as something which has predictable input and output. But the black box we can think of uh, as a more fundamental mode of, of contemporary power, contemporary knowledge, a technology that is stabilized enough, is tractable enough, is known enough, um, that it requires no further thought. But at the same time, may also be something um, on which power is enacted and operative uh, in order to close down um, capacities of knowledge about it. Here we've got a map of uh, a basic relational database. You can see at the same time that there's a, there's a greater degree of... Um, decentralization compared to uh, the APIs. Objects refer to other objects. We can say within a relational database of this kind, um, every entity or every category, every relation is also uh, an interface to every other. Yeah? So that you can interrogate, um, say we take an object, uh, a database like a student records uh, database, you can interrogate student records database on the basis of all the categories that pertain to it. So student number, date of birth, which course they're on, debt, of course, uh, 
or these key, these key kinds of categories that, that uh, student records uh, hold about a person, you can also then uh, view each person that belongs to the same category or each data point that belongs to the same category. So what we have is a highly flexible uh, mode of interrogating or of constructing a transparency of objects based around uh, their belonging to sets. So if we think about these kind of questions of the way in which the inter interrelation of transparency and closure or transparency and, and black boxness move in relationship to hardware, we can also say this, this movement um, is also changing. In, in the first iPhone, there were nearly 30 interfaces between components uh, by late uh, late last year, with, um, with the introduction of a new model, there were simply uh, five interfaces between hardware components. So we can see the exemplification of a kind of transparency, and there was a simplification of the technology, but at the same time there's a concentration of technological function into a smaller and smaller number of units, each of which are opaque in many ways to the others. We can say this corresponds in a certain way to Simon Don's movement from the abstract to the concrete. But I also want to think about how the question of uh, transparency and opacity or transparency in the construction of black boxes moves to the question of this, uh, the question of this conference, which is um, how this relates to the question of neoliberalism how neoliberalism sets up a form of governance in which there is a correlation or a codependency between modalities of transparency and modalities of, of opacity. And I think a reading of Friedrich Hayek's work will find that this is a kind of fundamental dynamic in the present. So this is Hayek uh, late in life. And this is him as a kind of feisty, uh, feisty youngster in 1945, writing about um, his, in one of his key early texts, The Uses of Knowledge in Society. So, in his kind of, probably his magnum opus, the 1973 to 1979 three-volume book, Law, Legislation and Liberty, Hayek proposes uh, a form of self-organization as a form of spontaneous order natural to the market. Uh, in it, he also proposes uh, something we've become familiar with today, the idea of um, open data, an idea that apparently comes uh, often from the left in this country, uh, but you can find most early, uh, most early formulations of it also from uh, libertarian economists and um, neoliberal economists of, of Hayek's kind. This book, uh, Law, Legislation and Liberty, also relies on the interplay between transparency and openness of markets. Its fundamental argument is around asymmetry of information and disequilibria of values. The, the, the kind of... In, the intent or the, uh, the interest of each, of each actor in the market are opaque to the others. What they have is the ability to engage with, with prices. And prices become the self-organizing mechanism uh, which he re-articulates his um, assessment of throughout, throughout his career. In this text, The Uses of Knowledge in Society, um, he begins to describe the market as a kind of technology, a market that works on the basis, or a technology that works on the basis of a kind of transparency and also articulates a grammar of certain kinds of opacity. We don't know why someone wants to buy something at a certain price, but we do know that they want to buy it at that price. 
at this moment. We don't know all the information in the world about the price of grain or the, uh, the cost of housing uh, in London, but we can know certain kinds of local knowledge or certain kinds of knowledge specific to our connections. Uh, this is something he poses as, as fundamentally different from more neoclassical economists who assume uh, total transparency uh, of, of, of knowledge and information. So Hayek proposes that the market is uh, a means of interfacing between disequilibri dis well, asymmetries of um, asymmetries of information. It also proposes that it's, um, it sets up a grammar that is transparent within its own terms, based around a, um, a fundamental opacity of the overall, um, overall nature of information. Hayek relies unusually, um, in a certain way, on a certain quote from Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, many of you will be familiar with his work as a um, previous warden of Goldsmiths. Uh, his collected emails and budgets are available in the library, of course. Um, but Whitehead, in his introduction uh, to mathematics, wrote, Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. So civilization advances by thinking or extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. The idea that the less, the less we have to think uh, about walking down the street or um, engaging with the computer's interface, the more, we can, more um, mental processing cycles we can, resolve, or we, can, we can resolve the world's problems with, perhaps, or think about the fundamentals of mathematics. Um, he wrote this, of course, uh, before the kind of collapse of, of formalism in mathematics that broke open some of the, the philosophical work that he'd set out in this book. But what Hayek takes from Whitehead is the idea that the more society provides you with the means to be ignorant, uh, to not know something, you know, so ignorant in a positive sense, not having the need to know something, so we don't have to know the, the way in which this computer works or the way in which the building is, is not going to collapse on our heads, the more we advance towards uh, a civilised state. But we can see here also, um, in this quote from Hayek from 45, a very interesting proposition that allows us to think about the market as also a form uh, of machine, a form of technology. So where he says it's more than a metaphor to describe the price system as a kind of machinery for registering change or a system of telecommunications, which enables individual producers to watch merely the movement of a few pointers, as an engineer might watch the hands of a few dials in order to adjust their activities to changes of which they may never know more than is reflected in the price movement. He's also proposing social relations as a kind of, of technology. He's proposing something that we might now see as a dashboard um, or something uh, rather like this. The way in which many apps disintermediate uh, relations between people, relations between one source of goods, uh, a, a consumer of certain sorts of goods and a supplier of certain sorts of goods, we can say that Hayek provides us with a means of understanding um, the way in which the appification of, uh, say, dating, uh, as we saw earlier with Grindr and other examples, um, is a space also uh, of, of value creation, in that you, you disintermediate the demand and the supply, you, you skim a, a fractional percentage of the top, although what a kind of fractional percentage of a sexual encounter might be um, is perhaps some into question. But you can find th this example, for instance, of, uh, of Uber, of something that takes people who can supply 
car time with people who need um, a lift or need, they need a taxi. You put yourself in between these, between these two places in the market. You, in, in effect, generate a market. So you act as an interface. You bring transparency to the situation of the market. But the transparency is around this very narrow, uh, narrow, narrow set of operations and operators and objects that the grammar of the software uh, entails. And we can see this kind of um, appification of the economy, appification of social relations becoming uh, quite widespread. But we can see also that they construct um, transparency and opacity in quite precise ways. There's a very kind of thin layer of, um, there's a very kind of narrow bandwidth of what is addressed, what is addressable, what is visible, what is invisible within these, within these systems. Here, rather bit mapped, unfortunately, is uh, someone operating a similar kind of system. It's uh, a drone pilot from the American Air Force who would be um, operating yeah, a very um, time-intensive system, system, I mean, system of interfaces that is, is obviously much more multiple than something like, um, something like Uber uh, or Grindr and so on, uh, but is also operating via regime uh, as someone like Paul Verilia has kind of so, so adequately kind of demonstrated of the construction of a certain kind of transparency, but operating it from uh, an air-conditioned black box in the Nevada desert. Now I want to move on to um, some discussion of the way in which this, this, this kind of structuring in the interplay between transparency and uh, opacity and black boxes moves in relationship to the construction of corporate HQs in, uh, in California at present. This uh, is the recent uh, Frank Gehry building for Facebook. As you can see, it's quite big. It has a park on the top, uh, carefully mapped to, it doesn't show your social network. Uh, it shows, it, it's kind of planned um, intuitive walks around the space. It's a move in, in Gary's architectural terms back to his earlier work, deconstructed buildings that, are, that look like sheds with corrugated iron, slabs of glass, and so on. So there's much, much more of a kind of broken architecture that implies an informality rather than his large-scale um, sails or fish-like constructions. Inside, we find Mark Zuckerberg's office. <laughs> and then the uh, spaces of work for the rest of the population. Both of them, you see this kind of rhetoric of um, the rough and ready mode of the architecture, this kind of shed-like space. We know Kohlhaas's kind of um, valorization of the giant shed. The executive as infant, and then the workspace as this kind of, you know, with the, with the flags hanging by the window as a kind of representation of a new uh, kind of internationalism. The workspace also is a space of a kind of flat hierarchy where everyone is transparent, visible, available, addressable to each other. And compare the rhetoric of this space um, to another space, Apple's headquarters. This is by Norman Foster uh, and will be ready next year. The design uh, features are very much reminiscent of Apple's own kind of the, the hardware. Um, the, the flush of the glass to the metal is according to the press release, is tighter than any other building ever made. The pieces of glass are bigger than any other uh, sheets of glass ever made. Um, this building is, of course, highly ecological, 
because you can walk from a car park to it, I think. Um, there you can see the bigness of the sheets of glass. There it looks quite splendid. There's an inside and some adverts just in case you didn't know which company you were working for. Um, chatting with your happy colleagues. So here we have you know, a lot of different modes of transparency uh, conflated. Transparency of architectural form, the whole, the, the kind of modernist project of glass buildings that we, that we know from uh, Paul Scherbat uh, onwards. Uh, the way in which also um, in ar architectural photography has changed in the, in the kind of era of Photoshop, uh, the way in which also um, this, this kind of rhetoric of soft focus, extreme focus, off-center focus, uh, gives us an idea of a kind of dynamic, informal place, which is also highly verdant. And here, at last, uh, is, of course... Uh, Google's new headquarters for Mountain View um, by Bjarke Engels Group and Thomas Heatherwick, uh, which will also come out next year, takes an existing plot of land next to their current headquarters uh, and expands it. Here, inside these buildings will be, um, as well as they have these enormous uh, glass Tents. So these are these are planes of glass held uh, in place by ten segrity structures. So more like tents than uh, than buildings, espousing the kind of wonder of openness that is Google. Uh, we also have um, port like the, the the floors. If you see, no, you, can't, you can't really see on this projection. You see a kind of shape jutting out there. These. Uh, story structures, these floor structures, are also um, decomposable, rebuildable, they're modular. So espousing the kind of modular virtues of um, contemporary, contemporary power. This campus will also be publicly accessible, partly because Google haven't been able to block rights of way uh, and land they're taking over from the community of Mountain View. And you can also see here... Uh, in, this, in this kind of um, form, some of the ways in which parametric design also operates as, as a mode of transparent power. The forces uh, of, of weights, tensions, uh, and the, the shape of the structure being given by the interaction between the site, the materials, uh, and the, um, the, the kind of tensions across the, across the surface also kind of speak of a kind of um, honesty to materials, uh, a, relation, a mapping of the relationship of um, tensions within the surface that also, in a sense, kind of uh, recapitulate the argument around transparency. Not only is the building transparent because it's made of glass, but also the way in which it shifts weights uh, and surface uh, and surfaces around in terms of the in terms of the overall structure. Here we've got these these what we can call kind of fortresses of transparency that r show very strongly a kind of rhetoric uh, of, of clarity, of openness, of uh, accountability and addressability. At the same time, you have the information flow within these organizations is heavily controlled by numerous kinds of policing, by different levels of, of pass, of non-disclosure agreements, access control to different spaces, intellectual property, um, intellectual property encoding, and also different project siloing. So as I mentioned before, there are different conflicts within, within Apple that manifest as different kinds of, uh, of interface. We can say also within Google, um, you have uh, similar kinds of uh, similar kinds of struggles around the purpose and mode of the of the corporation. 
So here the rhetoric is really, you know, is, is, is an attempt to go beyond interface. The idea is that we're so transparent that we're not operating an interface. This is what is presented uh, by these buildings. It's very much about the, the kind of the contemporary virtue of the flat hierarchy, uh, of, of clarity, of simplicity, reduction of clutter. Now I want to move on to some other, uh, to close, I want to move on to some kind of last considerations of some other architectural elements, what we can call kind of condensations of the black box uh, aesthetic. This is from a recent installation uh, at the Thomas Dane Gallery in London um, by an Irish artist, John Gerrard. And it's a picture of, well, it's a, it's a real-time rendering of uh, a Google server farm. Originally, Gerard uh, wrote to Google to ask to come and photograph his, uh, to come and photograph this space. They refused, so he hired a helicopter to fly around it and took around 30,000 photographs that was then uh, recomposed into um, a game engine or a kind of spatial simulation engine. This engine then kind of pans, or the, this engine, the, the camera, the point of view, the camera view of this engine then pans around, um, pans around the space. An operation that takes um, the duration of the exhibition to unfold. Here's some other views of it. As you can see, uh, utterly fascinating architecture. S there's no kind of uh, rhetoric of transparency. There's no rhetoric of greenness. Is the mode is more like that of an industrial plant. It's just pure processing, uh, in a sense. Whether it corresponds to any actual function is another is another question, of course. But there you have it. No one allowed in. Very few people actually um, running the site. Everything um, monitored remotely, and it epitomizes what we can call the black box aesthetic. This piece of work um, is echoed in, in a certain way by the work of another artist, Trevor Paglin, uh, who we can see here is an image of an actual site, except this one, rather than the Google server farm, is a CIA rendition site. Uh, Paglin's work involved making transparent certain of the operations of, of the CIA, especially in the conflict in Iraq, by working with amateur uh, plane spotters, aeronautics enthusiasts, and others to track um, proxy companies owned by the CIA or hired by the CIA to carry out the renditions. So people extracted from Libya, from Iraq and elsewhere to interrogation facilities uh, outside of US and NATO jurisdiction. And then went and found, found where they were flying to, followed the, the, tra the traces of these planes and then went and followed them to the point where they could photograph uh, the facilities in which people were being interrogated in. Further work, um, this is... Uh, a monitoring site in Cactus Flats in Nevada, taken from a distance of 18 miles. In this series, uh, he uses cameras and lenses that are specifically designed for photographing um, space, spatial bodies, stars, planets, asteroids, and so on. Uh, long distance tele um, photography. And photographs these installations from outside of the exclusion zone that is set up around them. So from outside of the, the, the perimeter fences. As you can imagine, there's a lot of stabilization of the camera needed uh, in order to take these photos. This one uh, is an Air Force flight test center in Nevada also from a distance of um, 26 miles. So here we can see also that you know, there's a kind of a, another kind of interplay between transparency and the black box. Um, this, photo, this series of photo photographs, the Limit photo Photography series, 
uh, from the middle of the last decade, mobilizes the camera as, as a black box, you know, it, perhaps almost the original black box, as a force uh, of transparency. It places the black box outside the perimeter and uses its capacity to open up uh, an engagement with the light emitted by a secret object. So what, what I think is perhaps, you know, this, this allows us for um, understanding the interplay between transparency and black boxes uh, in a novel way that allows, or at least suggests, um, another kind of critical mode, one that's not simply uh, about kind of rejecting um, either, either mode of transparency or black boxes, but of understanding um, their critical uh, interplay. Lastly, I want to suggest as paradigmatic of this is this photograph um, taken from two years ago. It's a Predator drone that got shot down uh, in Afghanistan, um, photographed on mobile phones by uh, the insurgents who, who took it down. In a way, we have, again, another grammar uh, of interaction between transparency, the thing becoming transparent, becoming visible, and the black box uh, on the ground, making itself subject to, or becoming forced to be subject to, other modes of inquiry. And I think this is the kind of, um, if we're to understand transparency or, and, black, and black sites, the interplay between them in the present, this, I think, is a kind of exemplary image that shows uh, potentially other modes of relation between the black box and uh, regimes of transparency. Okay, thank you.